This presentation is on the Babylon beast or the beast of Babylon. Even if you're an atheist, you've probably heard this terminology before or the concept or term mystery Babylon, which of course has both its physical and spiritual origin all the way back in the with the Tower of Babel and Nimrod or Dark Lord Nimrod, which is not only the, the actual birth of the literal Babylon, but the spiritual system of Babylon. That being stated, we should probably begin with what the what the biblical pages state about this about this Babylon. In Jeremiah 51, for example, Jeremiah prophesies that Babylon is going to be ultimately destroyed. The physical, literal Babylon, which occurred. Yet in those same texts, it appears that he's looking forward also to something larger occurring with Babylon, a mystery Babylon from Revelation chapter 17. And it states this, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Now in the book of Revelation, you're not going to be able to count up all the uses of the, of the number seven. Seven is a number of completion. But I'd like to highlight this right here, that there are seven angels that Yohannel, or John, he, he's the author of the book of Revelation. He was also the only one of the disciples who was present at the, who was a, an author of your biblical text, who was present at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 17, he writes this, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said unto to me, Come, and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth have committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Now this woman, this prostitute, is going to turn out to, in the text, be a, to be a city. John continues in this vision. I've also summarized some of the of it, summarized the text, but I've removed I've condensed some of it, and I'll point out some of the places where in a second. She held a, this is the prostitute, she held a golden cup in her hand, and it was filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Now she was also wearing purple and scarlet as her outfit. Now, this city that's being referred to is commonly compared to New York City. It's commonly compared to perhaps a rebuilding of the literal Babylon. I'm less convinced on that one by a lot. It's commonly compared compared to the city of Rome or the Vatican, along with a list of others. But I'd like you to bear in mind that no matter what anyone speculates that it literally is, or the time frame this text should literally be happening in, maybe right now, I'd like to point out that the mystery Babylon is a, just as Nimrod's empire was more than just a tower and a literal Babylon, it was a spiritual abomination. It was a spirit of Babylon, if you will. The name written on her forehead, this prostitute's forehead, was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and abominations of the whole earth. Passage 6. And I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this woman that he saw was not just wearing scarlet and purple, important colors, but she's sitting on a scarlet beast that has seven heads, and ten horns. Now the seven heads are told to you in the text to be seven hills, but also representing seven kings. Five who have been, one who is at the time of the writing of the document, and one that is yet to come. Now, for the purpose of this particular film, I'm going to lay some of that symbolic language just in your hands. So I want to move into the origin of all of this. John continues, 17 verse 8, The beast which you saw once was, so this was a beast that was in the past, is what it's stating, once was, now is not, it's not there at the time John is writing, yet will come up again upon, out of the abyss, 
and go to its destruction. So this is a beast that was at the beginning, just like Nimrod's empire was or Babylon was. It is not at the time of the writing of this document, but will come again at the time being seen in the vision. Yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life, I'd like to underline that right there. In the pagan text, they often talk about these tablets of destiny, as if Ham taught his sons, even Nimrod taught his generations beneath him, Ham, Cush, then you have Nimrod. They were teaching in all of their pagan documents that we point out in many of the films at God in a Nutshell. He, they have this terminology, even Marduk, the Babylonian Marduk, who's always writing, he's got a pet dragon. He's always boasting that somewhere in the back rooms he's got these tablets of destiny. I don't believe there were tablets of destiny that he had in the back room. I believe he's copying from his righteous men and his lineage, and so was Nimrod, and they're talking about this book of life, where the names of the righteous are written, the same book of life that God showed to Moses on the mountain. But every time you see these seven angels, like in Revelation, you have these seven angels, you're going to have discussion of this book of life. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life will be astonished when they see the beast. Then the angel said unto me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute sits are, they represent, so he's explaining the vision, the angel is explaining the vision, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues or languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. This is the fascinating part. Will hate the prostitute. So they're drunk with the wine from her, but they also hate her. They will bring her to ruin and burn her with fire. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. In the, in the times that this document is looking forward to. And then when that city is destroyed, the prostitute city is destroyed where all of the kings of the earth got drunk off of her. After they destroy her, they're going to weep and cry for her. Now, if we were to literally turn the page in the book of Revelation and go over to Revelation 18, we're going to learn that this, this city that's referred to as a prostitute, that she's destroyed in one hour and that this is the city where the kings of the earth meet. And of course, purple and scarlet, particularly at the time that John is writing that document, well, purple is one of the most prized. It's a sign of riches and it's a sign of abundance and wealth. This is why when they were mocking at Jesus, they're covering him with a purple robe while he's carrying the cross. It is a it's a symbol of the Roman religious and political system and the top of the pyramid, the wealth thereof, is what it's symbolic of. But if we turn the page to this mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, the merchants of the earth are weeping and crying because she's destroyed in one hour and her ports, so this is a city with ports, which is why many would compare it to, well, this is where all the kings of the earth meet. This is what leads many to do comparisons to mystery Babylon being New York. Also, many others will speculate that it might be the Vatican or other locations. I would like to I would like to hold firm to just the concept for this particular film of the spirit behind Mystery Babylon because no matter its location and it could be right it could in fact be multiplicities all in one but the spirit behind Mystery Babylon it is a spirit of prostitution of wealth and where the merchants and wealthy kings of the earth all have their all have their seats is what mystery babylon is referred to as in the text and they trade their fine garments fine linens gold pearls spices of every type and the last item listed is the the trafficking the slavery of human beings are traded one of the prized traded possessions of these merchants of earth in the document john is writing in Revelation 18.
and they weep profusely that the, the great whore city is gone. Now I'd like to set that right in your hand for a moment and rewind all the way backwards to the, to the origin of all of this to perhaps the, the days of Nimrod, the great mason tower builder, perhaps the first Freemason he's sometimes called. And I'd like to rewind through all of these empires you see behind you here. You go from the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Assyrians, and Assyrians. That is the empire really stored by Nimrod. There are six ages of empires. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Some would call this that you're living in right now, Rome phase two. But back at the very, during the time of the Romans, you had the come all be all sun god of sun gods. His name was Sol Invictus. He can be seen right here on this Constantine coin. Constantine is who amalgamated the political system of Rome with the religious system, forming what you know today as Catholicism. This happened during the time of the Romans. In fact, during the time of the Romans, all, Rome was never conquered. It fell under the bureaucracy and weight of itself. And all of your major empires for a time would turn into major religions. But all through the ages of history, kings would cover this strange character, this being of light, this sun god that would come forth and would literally tell kings, if you would just, just bow down to me, build your empires in, in praise to me, build grand idols to me, then I will give unto thee all the riches of the world. And in fact, these sun gods, so we go from right here, Sol Invictus of the Romans, Helios during the time of the Greeks, Mithra during the time of the Persians, the Shemesh during the time of the Babylonians, Ra for the Egyptians with the serpent, the sun disk encapsulated by the serpent on top of the head, and of course Utu during the time of the Assyrians or Sumer and Accord. All of these sun gods, and by the way, this sun god timeline here, so each set of beliefs is literally packaged into the next empire's beliefs. They build upon each other. And these would make the come all be all mystery teachings, like mystery Babylon, that would lead all the way to the days of the Greeks and the Romans, and even probably the teachings held in back rooms of this very day. Well, these sun gods on this very timeline here, actually, in truth, in the movie Volve, they actually make Volve 1 and Volve Part 2, they actually, as we walk through and look at them, they actually make a, a dark prophecy. So this sun god being who's saying, just bow down to me and I will give unto the empires. Well, these actually make a long dark prophecy that's stating when this suffering servant, when this Messiah comes, that you are to put the crown of thorns, of thorns, onto his head. You are to crucify him. You are to sacrifice him. So that's actually what the teachings of all of these empires lead to. But if I rewind backwards from the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Assyrians, all the way back, all the way back to the days right here of Dark Lord Nimrod, son of Cush, son of Ham, son of Noah, with the three sons that got off of that boat. You see a division in the beliefs of the, of the families, something that happened here, something that happened with Ham's sons, seen right here, he had four of them and a dispute that he had, that Ham had, with, with Noah, where Ham basically states he put a curse on Ham's son, Canaan, that we're going to get to in a minute. But all occult today, so through Cush, you get Babylon and Nimrod, through this lineage here, Cush, that was the favorite son of Ham. And over here, Egypt, otherwise called Mitzrayim, is where you get the empire of, of Egypt. All occult today comes from Babylonian and Egyptian belief systems. 
And Babylon and its beliefs and its disagreements with Noah, they're seen on the very rocks, come through this lineage right here. Nimrod, named in marker, most probably in the ancient world, Right here on the document, in Mark on the Lord of Arata, Cush, who we find covered on the Sumerian king's list. And by the way, Cush is covered as having made travel across the seas fit for the son of a sun god. So we know by that alone that his father, Ham, or Utu, was already calling himself a sun god. This is Utu's sun disk up here. It's got the four cardinal points and the three wavy lines. It represents a calendar, but it's also a sun disk is what it is. And it's eerily similar to what you find. Not only are the temples they were building out there, on one side I have Sumerian, Akkadian, over here with the sun disk for Utu, the father of Meshki and Gesher, or Kush. And over here I have a Mayan temple, a Mayan calendar for the temples of the sun. Meshki and Gasher journeyed and then vanished into the seas and made travel suitable for the son of the sun god. Now, was he the one that founded the empires out there in the Americas? I don't know. I can only tell you that the building structures look identical. They're temples to the sun and even the sun disks look very similar. If we come backwards one more, we make it to Utu, the Shamash. His idols look identical to the god Enlil, who is the twin of Inki. We'll touch on that a little bit. Here's the long and short of that in my view. When Utu or Ham does something wrong, it wasn't really Ham that did it. It wasn't really Utu that did it. That was the god Enlil. Then we come back one more and we find the one that they both loved and hated. They talked about Noah under hundreds of different names and hundreds of languages on, I don't know how many documents, at least hundreds, spreading out all across the earth. In those documents, you can even see the dispute, the split up in the families, where one side all of the kids made mistakes. Ham never reconciled with his father. That's what I read on the rocks. And Ham, the great sun god, is the eye back there, couldn't keep his hands off other people's kids. That's according to their own documents and legends all the way down after that. And Noah got mad. But no matter the case, that rewinds us back to about right here in the division of the suns and the birth of what we today call Babylon. Now the Tower of Babel, and I just want to toss some loose math out there for you. I would like to submit to your hands the argument right here at the start that, well, so if you do the, so the Tower of Babel appears, and men will argue this, to be about 300 to 325 years, and I don't want to be rock solid on these numbers, I just want to lay some numbers out for you, roughly 325 years after the flood. If I go with a low population growth rate, beginning with eight people, at a growth rate of 3.5%, and that's, <laughs> there's not a lot to do but build temples and breed like rabbits in the evenings. So that number could be a lot higher than that. But even at these lowball numbers, you're at 900,000 people on the earth at the time of the building of that tower. And I would further argue that many of the beliefs that you have that go today by the name Mystery Babylon don't just come through the lineage directly through the lineage of Ham, but actually come more directly through this son that for whatever reason Noah was so angry that he didn't put a curse on Ham, he put it on this son Canaan, the one for whom you get the imagery or lord of the imagery today of the little devil horns. Now, I'd like to walk you through the origin of this Babylonian beast, this system. That's what it is. The, ba the beast of Babylon is a, it's a system, is what it is. And I'd like to walk you back through all the way to the origin of that system. And it comes to these three sons. And all of these ages of empires that you see on the screen right behind me. And I really honestly hope that in the future that your universities will actually take much of this kind of stuff seriously because these documents, no one will argue that many of these documents, this one here, the Sumerian Kings List, I went through myself and have itemized out what each section means. And it doesn't necessarily make me right. 
put it out there for you to decide if it's right, but it's probably closer than it was over at the universities because their every other word is it can't match with the Bible, but they do. And the simplest explanation is on the pagan stuff, demons are good, and the biblical stuff, demons are bad. But they're telling roughly the same story. And I can't tell you if these documents are correct. They're probably not, many of them, particularly the pagan stuff. It's pagan stuff. But I can tell you what they were stating. For example, here on the Sumerian Kings List, it's one of your earliest documents on the face of the entire earth. And the model of all of your pyramids that would pop up all over the place, including out here in the Americas. They began right out there in Sumer and Accord, not far from where the boat that saved all mankind, Noah's Ark, landed. The Sumerian Kings List, the first three sections. The pre-flood world is lines 1 through 39. By the way, over at GodInTheNutshell.com, I've actually broken down what's in, what are the elements, without going weird directions on this stuff, but laying it out flat in your hand in ways that probably make a lot of sense. Even to a kooky old university professor who would prefer to tell you stories about anything but what the documents just state. Lines 1 through 39 deal with the pre-flood world. Lines 40 through 94, or roughly, they're about, they deal with the families and tribes after the flood. This is going to match, by the way, with the pages of Genesis leading to the Tower of Babel account, which is where you arrive at right here, and what I've titled the Rise of Nimrod's Empire, which is going to be on that document, that pagan stone, in my view, lines 95 through 133. That's what it's simply going to be. And in this presentation I'm showing you now, I'm going to walk you through the literal birth of these sun gods from the Romans all the way back to the very beginning when those boys came off of that boat. My name is Trey Smith of Garden in a Shell, and what I have behind me here on the screen is the, is the Garden in a Shell website. A lot of people have asked what happened, so it was a time period for actually several years where I didn't post anything. We were working on, I put together a series of films in that, in that time frame that I think are some of the best work that we've ever done. But people have asked, and here's some of the DVDs on the back screen. This is the God in a Nutshell website at GodInTheNutshell.com. Many have asked, why were you silent for so long? I'm going to tell you right here in this part of the film. I had a flooding was working on the film Exodus and I nearly had that completed and I have a devastating flooding destroyed my entire home and what I was working on at that time actually right when I was about to get married as well and I lost all of it and it destroyed me for a period of time I believe the Lord does all things as devastating as it was I believe the Lord does all things for a reason and I believe some of I believe we're going to we are heading for to put together that exodus the films that are in that partner section I believe are some of the best work that I've ever done and the Lord did some shaking of me at that time I would also inv I want to thank all of you that have become partners on the God in a Shell website it's about eight bucks a month honestly speaking it's what allows me to do these films at all but I'd also like to uh, ask you to pray this with me I would like to do the best exodus in the world if that's possible but at least the best we've done and it will be better than what I had before when I make it At the top of this screen we have a, a donate button and if the Lord places it on your heart I would like I will not I do not think I will let you down I think I'm, we're gonna make some incredible work I think there's some incredible work in there right now and I'm also praying for I'm also praying for a home for me and my wife again and a place to do these films that we've kind of done it in makeshift ways and I thank you for hearing me there's a donate button on the top and I thank you for watching these films at all over time I'm Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell these sections, these sections that I'm about to play for you come out of, well, they come out of the, the movie The Vol of Part 1, or Part 1 and Part 2, which is in my hand. I'm working currently on The Vol of 3, and I'm going to make it through the Exodus. I'm going to do that this year. Come out of The Vol of Part 1, which is available in full length for streaming on GodInTheNutshell.com. I titled these parts The Babylon Beast, The Origin. I think it's a good presentation of them. As far as I know, it's one of the first times in history that people have put together the biblical text and the biblical story with the actual stuff out there from Sumer and Akkad and the ancient world and broken it down and amalgamated it. And it fits far better than anyone 
could have, myself included, would have imagined. And I would pray that in the future that the universities take it more seriously. These sections are called the Babylon Bees, the origin. And I think between the Bible and even the pagan text, all of it was put together for you to have in your hands. In fact, for these hours of history right now. Without further ado, let's step into the parts of these films behind me that deal with the literal birth of the systems that you have even with you today, the birth of Babylon. And taking that a step further in the lineage of these 11 sons becoming the 11 Canaanite tribes, you're going to have, well, in those tribes, you have ones like the Hivites, it means wicked, wickedness, cavemen, their ancestor was seer, meaning hairy goat demon temptist. And even the Apkelu, which are going to be intermingled in, even in that legend of Enlil and Menlil, she's going before the Anoks, the Anunnaki priests in those Sumerian texts. These are somehow at the heart. There were seven of these Apkelu sages listed right here at the heart of Utu, the first sun god's empire. And I even find their positions interesting because Uanna, that's possibly one, a sage or conjurer for Emana. Then we come down here, you have in Enloda, the conjurer for the city of Eridu, that's where the Tower of Babel would rise. And of course, number seven would be Utu Abzu, the one who ascended into heaven, which is a twisted version of who Enoch was. Here's where I'm going with this. In some strange way, at the heart of Utu, or Ham's empire, when he left, he's actually recreating the other seven family members, the other seven seats of authority or power, but in a twisted and upside down way, almost like a creepy way, where whatever he asks, no matter what it is, his conjurers holding those same seats as Noah and his brothers and their wives would hold, in my view, in my spirit, he's literally recreated those seven positions in an occult format and sometimes has them put on outfits to pretend that they are pre-flood chimera creatures, to pretend that they are conjuring the spirits of his ancestors like Enoch and giving him the answers that he wants. And even more so, speaking of, of Enoch, well, here's his seven sages of Sumer right here. If we're to look over at Enoch, the seventh from Adam, a twisted version of which is on this Enoch stone right here. Utu Abzu is what he had the nerve to call it. Utu, a reference to himself, and Abzu, a reference to the abyss, the place the Inki comes from. Well, his seven sages of Sumer, or his Apkelu or Anunnaki sages, the sons from which you get those giants out there in the promised land, are literally a recreation of the seven angels that you read about, a dark version of the seven angels you're reading about that Enoch had communication with in that pre-flood world. Uriel, Raphael, Ragiel, Michael, Serakel, Gabriel, and Ramiel is what he's recreating on those stones. It's creepy, isn't it? But no matter the case or how any views it, he is depicted on these stones. There's Utu right there, coming up from between the mountains with his witch's hat on. There's a Nana with her six arrows in her back. And he's being guided by the Inky, coming out of his dimensional portal to Abyss. That's specifically where it's from. With his falcon, his raven, his crow. To start the new cities of Earth. The cities of Sippar, Babylon, ultimately going down to Kish or Cush, Uruk or Ur, Larsa, all the way down here to where the Tower of Babel was, as well as with Nineveh and other cities that his sons and grandsons would found. The basis of all of these cities, what would be called the mystery religions, and the basis of all of these rocks is sexual immorality. And what you're really reading on all of these stones, whether you're dealing with the Enuma Elish or others, and certainly in my view, and certainly on the Atrahasis tablet, on the Epic of Gilgamesh, is a split off of the families. On one side, demons good. 
on the other side, demons bad. In short, of the three brothers, it's not just Ham that's leaving, but also he's taking with him this entire bunch here, which is going to go from Cush, from whom you get Nimrod, to Put, another one of his four sons, to Egypt, or Mitzrayim, this is actually where you get the word Egypt, is from that son, and the teachings that come through him. And then, of course, last but not least, the one that I'd like to focus on, right down here, Canaan. Now the word Canaan, as seen right here, Ham's son after the flood, Canaan, the word means humiliated. That's what the word means. However, if we look at this genealogy again, the one for whom Noah lived 950 years, 350 of that after the flood. Well, all three of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all three of these boys were born roughly in the 500th year of Noah's life. Five is the number of grace. The flood happened in the 600th year of Noah's life. Meaning that all three of these boys lived roughly 100 years, right there is Shem, right down from Noah, Shem, 100 years before that flood. So when it states in your text that, that these boys were young men, but they lived 100 years before the flood, here again you have another example of the definition of young man is a hundred years old. They, for a hundred years, saw, physically saw, that pre-flood world. All three of those boys did. And Shem lived a total of 600 years, that's the number of man, and 500 of it, the number of grace, was after that flood. But all three boys lived roughly a hundred years before that flood. So where did this name Canaan, this name Canaan, Perhaps a strange one or a strange lineage of things, what would lead to giants and other such things. Where did the same Canaan come from? Ham's son, who after the flood, Canaan means humiliated. Well, before the flood, you have, if I come down this list from Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Canaan. Only Canaan in English can be spelled a variety of different ways. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan. The fourth one down from Adam. Canaan, Canaan. Now, of course, this thing reads in order. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching, that's Enoch's name, his death, whose death, God's death, shall bring the despairing, that's you and I, rest and comfort, that's Noah's name. But if I come up here from Adam, which means man, Seth, which means appointed. Seth was the replacement for Abel, who Cain killed. Cain murdered Abel. And Eve asked for another son to replace Abel, whom Cain slew wrongly. And that son was Seth. And this is the lineage and genealogy that we follow here. Whereas you've got in that pre-flood world another genealogy. The genealogy of Cain, who killed Abel. But it's not this genealogy that begins after Adam with the one with the replacement for Abel. And then you have Enosh, his name means mortal. And then we have fourth one down, fourth one down, probably the weakest name in the entire list, Canaan. And Canaan means, right there, it means, means sorrow, is what it means. Now, what happened in the days of Canaan? Well, in the book of Yasher, specifically Yasher 2, it states this, beginning in verse 11. And Canaan grew up, now this is the pre-flood Canaan, forth from Adam. His name means sorrow. And when he was 40 years old, he became wise and had knowledge and skill in all wisdom. And he reigned over all the sons of men. And he led the sons of men to wisdom and knowledge. For Canaan was a very wise man. And he had understanding in all wisdom. Wait a second, what kind of wisdom was this? And with his wisdom, he ruled over the world of spirits and demons. What was it that Ham fantasized about when he started calling himself the sun god? There's his little box of demons down there that he controls. Let me keep going. But Canaan, even in this, even the weakest on the list, number four, 
His name means sorrow. He knew by his wisdom, even playing with the spirits and demons as he did, that God would one day destroy the sons of men for having sinned upon the earth, and that the Lord would in later days bring upon them the waters of the flood. And in those days, Canaan, he wrote upon tablets of stone. And he kept those tablets in his treasuries. Well, well, if we look back up here and we look at Sippor, Sippor, where Utu had his first Ebabar, his White House, well, uh, tablets like these that have all the festivals and all the law, even written by later kings, tablets like these were to be kept in boxes like this one in the, the Sun God, the king's treasuries. Now, if I keep coming down this list from Adam on down in Kenan, in the days of Kenan, it says he turned some men to the Lord. But he also believed that he had power over spirits and demons, just like Utu did, the first son God. Almost as if all of these documents here are somebody reaching into the dark parts of the pre-flood world and fantasizing about them, and fantasizing moreover about the sons of Cain which you see really emerge, pop up during the days of the pre-flood Canaan. But if I keep going down that list, one, two, three, four, five, well, what do you know about that? Number six, was it not in the days of Yared that we read, the father of Enoch, the sixth from Adam, Yared would be, was in the days of Yared that we read, the events of Genesis six and the events of Enoch six, where a set of fallen angels came in onto Mount Hermon, at the base of which is Pan's cave, where they would sacrifice children. And in those hours before the flood, men were worshiping these fallen angels who had come in to play gods and lords and masters and kings with mankind and to take of the women. And we begin first learning about all of the practices of the summonsing of demons and communication of demons. Just as we see when we look at the author of this stone, which of course would begin with Utu, the first sun god of earth, it's his scribes, it's his children that are authoring these kings list. And it's not this list of names that's getting praise, but to the complete contrary, it's this list here, which seems intermingled, Lord Anak, Lord Anak, Lord Anak. And between them, between them is Dumazid, which is another name for Tammuz, Inkadu, the seed of sin. Inkadu means Inki created, which is the name of Gilgamesh's friend. Are we talking about one and the same with Canaan on that list and the giants that would later inhabit the promised land? I have no idea, I'd lay that in your hands. But I know on these stones is always, and on this list here, is intermingled entirely, and they make it abundantly clear on their rocks. The summonsing of fallen entities, demons and devils, is what they're literally talking about. And it's integrated right with the name of this one on their text. But whoever had authored these documents had forgotten the names of their fathers on this list here. And in fact, if I come down from Enoch, who would be the seventh from Adam, the Zion, and I come down to the ninth, the ninth, the number nine, could be something good in there, could not be something good in there. The number ninth on this list would be Lamech. And I go over and I come over to the book of Enoch, chapter 106, being that they so badly in those worlds after that flood wanted their sun gods, their Prometheus, best known for defying the gods. This could be the story of Lucifer, could be the story of one third of the angels that fell, or it could be the story of one of the three brothers that fell who took on the personification of a sun god. After all, the Prometheus is best known for defying the gods 
by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge, and civilization. Only he didn't do that. He even held back the calendar from his own sons so that he could be the sun god. That's what he did. That's the truth of the matter. But what was he? He was a crafty trickster to the Greeks and Romans, but also the light bearer coming forth to birth those first civilizations of all earth. Well, perhaps the author of these stones, looking at all of these fallen angels and beings, if that be him, one of the three, on his own rocks, forgot the story of his father, the tenth number of completion, the tenth from Adam, Noah, meaning rest or comfort. The story given by Enoch in his line, the seventh from Adam. And being that the author of these stones is also the birther, Egypt and Babylon, of all the mystery religions on earth, perhaps he also forgot that Enoch went into those fallen angels and said, the Lord God of heavens bears a message for you. You thought you knew secrets. Little did you know you only knew the worthless ones. And perhaps even beginning in the days of Ham's son, Utu's son, Cush, Meshki and Gasher, who took off on a boat, perhaps to brand the image of the sun god in the temples to the moon all across the Americas and jungles of the ancient world, where they would worship as royalty and kings, anything strange. Well, before that time, in the time of that pre-flood world, when Enoch went in into the temples of Semyaza and Azazel, the two heads of the 200 angels who had fallen upon Mount Hermon, the base of which is the cave they would give child sacrifice to the god Pan. And Enoch said to those angels, the Lord God of the heavens, has said you should intercede for men and not men for you. Behold, a heavy sentence has gone forth to put thee in bonds. Never again shall ye return into the heavens for all eternity. It was then, according to the text, that big, tough, fallen angels tore their clothes and wailed and screamed in their dark torchlit halls and Uriel said to me here shall stand the angels that have connected themselves with the women and their spirits assuming different forms are defiling mankind as sun gods and moon gods through the ages and hours of history and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as their gods. That's what the text states. Here they shall stand until the day of the great judgment. God's been talking about this since the beginning of the book, where they will be judged and made an end of. And the women also of the angels, the women that combined with the angels who went astray, shall become as sirens. And I, Enoch, saw the vision and the end of all things. No man shall see as I have seen. Ah, but wait. Enoch 81 and Uriel said unto me, observe Enoch, these heavenly tablets. Uh-oh, would these possibly be the same tablets? of destiny and those that decide destinies of the righteous that Utu, dear, dear Utu, was talking about to his sons, that he claimed his Apkelu conjurers had? I think not. Or are these the tablets that Moses spoke of when he was on top of the mountain being told by the tongue of Enoch to his children that Utu, the first sun god of earth, wished he could get back to.
these documents were on the boat, I'll tell you that right now. Observe ye, Enoch, these heavenly tablets, and read what is written thereon, and mark every individual fact. And I mean the words of Enoch, the actual scrolls of Enoch, the book of Enoch was on board the boat, not the heavenly tablets that he's recording and telling his sons about. Just wanted to clarify that. And I observed the heavenly tablets and read everything which was written thereon and understood everything and read the book of the deeds of all mankind, the book of the living. And of all the children of flesh that there shall be upon the earth to the remotest of generations. And therewith I blessed the great Lord and King of glory forever and ever, in that he has made all the works of the world. The demons would claw in their clothes and give anything to have their name written one time in that book. And I extolled the Lord because of his patience and blessed him because of the children of men. And after that I said, Blessed is the man who dies in righteousness. Noah was called the righteous even on all these pagan stones even by the god of the air in Lil, that ran with Utu from the mountains. It was the righteous who decide destinies, was it not, of whom he spoke? Blessed is the one that dies in righteousness and goodness, concerning whom there is no book of unrighteousness written, and against whom no day of judgment shall be found. These words were on the boat with Noah. And those seven holy ones, wait, had, had Utu created seven dark ones? Seven dark ones? Seven dark Apkelu witch doctor conjures? The same as Nimrod had in his court, with Anaki as their head, who would birth all the children of abomination? What are we copying here? These seven holy ones brought me and placed me at the door of my house and said to me, Declare everything to thy son Methuselah and show to all thy children that no flesh is righteous in the sight of the Lord, for he is their creator. One year we will leave thee with thy son, till thou givest thy last commands, that thou may teach thy children these records we give you now, that you may share them, these words, on that boat with all the generations of the world. In his 600th year, and much has happened, his father, Laman, passed away five years before, and his grandfather, Methuselah, now Methuselah's name means his death shall bring, Methuselah, his name means his death shall bring, or his death shall bring the judgment, died in the past year. So the year of the flood, Methuselah had died, or seven days before the flood died at the age of 969. Methuselah was the longest living man in the text. But if I come from Adam down to Noah, actually Noah's father, Lamech, in the book of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and being that they all went to such lengths to birth even their empires all the way to the Romans and their, and their sun gods, beginning with Utu, and to defeat that true son of God and put the crown of thorns on his head. And in Utu's case, old Utu, thrown from the two mountain peaks to impersonate a claimed son God. Well, surely in that case, leading all the way to these, they perhaps knew this story from Enoch 
but they also twisted. And here we go. Enoch, chapter 106. And after some days, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech. Here's Methuselah, right here. He's the longest living man in your biblical text in 969 years. His name means his death shall bring, or his death shall bring the judgment. His son is Lamech, whose son would be Noah. Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech, and she became pregnant by him and bore a son. And his body was white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool, and his eyes were beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun. And the whole house was very bright, and thereupon he arose, this child arose in the hands of the midwife. And he opened his mouth, and he conversed with the Lord of Righteousness. Who is this? And his father, Lamech, was afraid of him and fled the house. And he went to his father, Methuselah, and he said unto him, For I have begotten a very strange son, diverse from and unlike man, and resembling perhaps the sons of God of heaven, the angels, the Bnei Ha Elohim, is what he's stating. And his nature is different, and he is not like us, and his eyes are as the rays of the sun, and his countenance is glorious. And it seems to me that he is not sprung from me, but from the angels. And I fear that in his days a great work, a great wonder, a great fear may be wrought upon the earth. And now, my father, I am here to petition thee and implore thee that thou mayest go to Enoch, our father, and learn from him the truth. For his dwelling place, Enoch's dwelling place, is amongst the angels. Enoch never actually died in your text. Enoch was not, for God took him. And his son was Methuselah, and Methuselah went. And then it states here, and I, and by the way, the book of Enoch, as it gets down into it, is actually, there are portions even of excerpts of Noah. It's more like a family record. And in my belief, it would have been kept on that boat. But no matter what you believe, here's what it reads next. And I, Enoch, answered and said unto him, Methuselah, the Lord will do a new thing on the earth. And this I have already seen in a vision. And make known to thee that in the generation of my father, Yerit, some of the angels did go astray. They transgressed the word of the Lord. And behold, they have united themselves with women on the earth and have committed a great sin with them. And some of the angels have married some of the women of earth and have begotten children by them. And they shall produce on the earth giants, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. And there shall come a great punishment on the earth. And the earth shall be cleansed from all impurity. Enoch continues, Yea, indeed, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth. And there shall be a great deluge, that means a flood, and a great and mighty destruction for one year on the earth. Yet this son who has been born unto you shall be left on the earth, and his three children shall be saved with him, when all mankind that are on the earth shall perish, shall die in this flood. He this one that converses with the Lord of heaven and his three sons shall be saved. And now go and make known to thy son Lamech that he who has been born into his house is in truth his son. And you shall call his name Noah. My name is Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell. That was only about 30 minutes of one of the one of the Vov films available for streaming over at GodinaNutshell.com.
In that same partner section over at GodInTheNutshell.com, you'll find a film in there titled The Last Prophecy. It's about two and a half hours long. By the way, both of these Volv films are roughly three hours, maybe a little bit better in one of the cases of the Volvs, a little more than three hours long. The Last Prophecy, I timelined out the prophecies of Kim Clement. I also combined them with some other things. It's a heavy duty presentation in in my view of those of those prophecies and the best that I've done I would only feel comfortable with that longer version a two and a half hour version in that partner section at God in a nutshell and I think you'll see why when you look at the film here on the screen behind me this is all these shots by the way actually this is the road on the partner section right here it's the road from Silverton to Uray in Colorado most all the shots including in Israel and other places that you see on all these different screens on God and the Nutshell show actually taken I would hook up cameras to the front of the front of the car and drive down risky places to capture capture the the footage from time to time I still do I'm praying for I'm praying for to take these things up to another level and to do some of the most incredible work that we have done and if the Lord does place it on your heart as someone that watches these films or I think you'll find that the stuff is far more functional than it ever was in the past in those sections at God in the nutshell those partner sections I think the films that are in there, I mean, it's for you to decide, but I, I, think, I think they are probably the best work that I've, that I've done. And, and I think also the Lord's given me some focus on these films. I am praying that we will be able to take this up. It's rare, if ever, that I've ever asked for donations to God in a nutshell. But on this occasion, I, I am. And I'm also praying for a home for my wife and I. And, and a place to comfortably do these films in a very good way in the future. God bless every single one of you and your families on the other side of the screen.